exhibition of Dave Richardson's paintings at the Solo Art uh, Centre on, on, on um, whatever road, just off Mill Road. And I'm just looking at the paintings and think this is a really good space and they really uh, have made a really attractive um, exhibition that people are coming into. There's really a lot of people showing a lot of interest and, and getting very excited about the paintings. And it's really um, starting to make people think and be really stimulated by the pictures that they see, even to the point of asking, um, what's the charging for these? It's not advertising them as being for sale, but they're very interested in the actual paintings. They're very colourful, they're very exciting in that kind of way, but they do make you, the titles are very evocative um, that send you spiralling into thinking about what's going on in your head. So that's all I've got to say. I'm really interested to see how many people have turned up there. And as I understand it, this is going to close shortly. Um, I think it's very worthwhile that it's kept open regardless of the ownership. And I think it's very important that open spaces in Cambridge are available for artists. I think it's a very good reflection and uh, way to promote alternatives in Cambridge. Um, my name is Fiona Butcher and I live in Romsey. I've lived in Cambridge for 10 years and I'm very proud to be a Romseyite, part of this artistic creative community. So, a wonderful hub for artistic activity. Um, it reminds me very much of the Rowan in Chesterton. Um, uh, beautiful artwork. Um, the great shame is that there's a struggle to keep this artistic community open. And I think we Romseyites should all uh, get together and make sure that this creative hub in our wonderful district of Romsey can keep going. I have just spent, um, you know, uh, half an hour looking at the exhibition. It's very interesting because it it um, it spans the world of mental health and science, and I, I understand the artist is uh, both a scientist. And unfortunately, I didn't get to because he had to talk to many other people. I didn't get to explore um, a little bit further about the paintings, but I should go away and look online and I would like to find out more. It's very, very interesting. I recommend that people come and visit this exhibition. Exhibition. Um, very thought-provoking. Uh, also very colourful and beautiful. Yeah, I'm David Richardson. I'm, I'm currently having an exhibition here. And um, I, don't, I didn't know a lot about the art salon before... Um, I was invited to exhibit here, but um, uh, I don't know where else in Cambridge that I could exhibit in a space like this, as big as this, with these lovely white walls. Um, I know there are galleries like Cambridge Contemporary Art, etc., but I don't know if they would hold an exhibition. I know you could go to churches or, or, or sort of community centres, but to tell you the truth, personally, I lived in Cambridge for a while, I am an artist. And um, uh, I don't know where else I could have exhibited and, as well, um, could have been supported the way I was. You know, because I, um, you know, I, I have some emotional problems and I'm not able to organise myself very well. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of an artist, I suppose. And uh, I have been supported from start to finish, basically. Um, and um, even with... Put, I'm not very good at organising the drinks and all that. I can only, I'm pretty good at painting, but I'm not good at organising and doing everything. That was all done. I did do a bit, but you know what? A lot of it I was helped out with. And um, I, I'm so grateful. My children came here. They're proud of their dad. I had 40 to 50 people come on my opening night. I'm so proud. I thought I'd fail. I thought no one would come because I didn't put enough flyers out. But well, it turned out that Rufy and behind the scenes had done a lot because they got so many contacts. So they've done a lot for me. So I'm very grateful to the Cambridge Arts Salon and um, I'd like to see it, you know, keep going. I don't, I don't know if it's the most meaningful one. It's, I think maybe it's the one I currently like the most, that's all I can say. Um, because I like the... I like... I like the Michelangelo's Last Supper. I do. I, I, I keep looking at... I 
keep looking at it. And um, but you know, un unlike me, Michelangelo, you know, he he, he painted the literal uh, interpretation of the Last Supper, which was a long table in 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 a room in a space. And for me, I, I needed to um, take it away, take, remove it all, remove the contact, remove everything, and, and try to look behind what was going on. And that, I suppose that's what these six, what I say, religious paintings are trying to do. They remove the, the, the scene, they take away the, they take away everything, and, and they look behind it, sometimes at the miracle, and. Um, so I've laid out the upper room and the Last Supper in, it in, in, in something circular. And so I've called this one Resurrection Wallpaper around the upper room at the Last Supper, realised during his ascension. So if you perhaps look at the whole painting, uh, you know, look at the whole thing, it, this, is, this is Jesus ascending, it, it, ascending into heaven. And, and that, that, that little thing there... It is, it is like a rocket. And I suppose anyone who witnessed the... Um, it's such a short piece. It's Luke and Acts of the Apostles. And I always wonder why the Ascension is, is, is... It should have been a spectacularly long piece written about it. But it's so short. And I'm wondering whether the reason why it was so short... It, it was very dreamlike. The people who witnessed it... It was a very dreamlike event, and and everything was flashing before them as he was um, ascending away from them. Um, and so, so I, I don't know. I don't want to talk about this painting anymore. Um, have a look at this one here. Do you know that that one there? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to go into it, right? But there was a there was a a guy here with his daughter, and she was about eight or nine. And she loved this one. She loved it. Um, and she says, Daddy, I want it. Right? Well, well. I, I, he, he actually, I, I, I explained the painting. I said, do you know that, you know, this is called, um, you know, he died for our sins and then went to Hades before he rose from the dead. Um, and I explained everything here. And I explained, I said, do you realise that there is a swastika there and that stands for the sins that, man did to man in the 20th century and he died for them too and I said so do you realise that you know your daughter wants this picture and um, he, he, he said yes and, and he wants me to do a print, he can't afford the original but he wants me to do a print and that print is going to go in his daughter's room and she's nine that's profound isn't it, don't you think yes. I mean I don't know if I could ever sell that thing but um yeah, a nine-year-old likes it. That makes it for me. That makes it for me, yeah. I don't know. What else? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've divided the room up. So you've got the six religious paintings going along here. Um, and then this side... So I, 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 paint in, um, I paint in two different ways. I... I, I Currently, there's two lines of investigation. I, I have um, my New Testament religious investigation. Um, and yes, I'm continuing with um, expressive, symbol, surrealic, um, psychoanalytical investigation. And that's been going on for 20 years. Um, again, I don't really want to go into talking about every specific painting, but... Um, what I try to do, I suppose, is to personify human emotion. So, uh, for instance, there might be one title called uh, Love and Trust, Go for a Walk. Or um, Jealousy and Trust. And you can't really see them. You can't see... You see the effects of jealousy and what trust is like. But you can't actually see them as a physical thing. So what I try to do is, is personify human emotions that we can't see. We can see the effects of them, like the wind. See the effects of the wind, you can't see the wind. I try to make the wind, if you like, into a person. So I'm personifying human emotions here. I call it 
my, I call it psychoanalytical, it's a bit, a bit fancy, you know. Um, and um, the colours I use um, have developed over time, probably over about 25 years. I had a background with a training under a neo-expressionist, and I, uh, they're discordant colours. So I use colours on a dog leg and the colour wheel, so they kind of jar, and they create a, uh, a dream-like effect. And it's like a puzzle. It's like solving a puzzle. It's uh, depending on the size of the colour in relationship to the next size of another colour will depend on whether it works or not. And interestingly, when I was a very, very, very young boy, um, I used to have dreams about very bright colours and very long numbers. And they used to be really very disturbing. Um, and, and, a, and a way I used to get agitated as a young boy, and a way I used to um, calm myself was to colour, shape and colour next to each other until it, um, I suppose the only way I can say it, until it looked right. And when it looked right, I used to stare at it, and it used to calm me down. <laughs> and I suppose I'm still doing it. Um, I'm going for a crisis at the moment, you know. Um, I don't know if painting's helping me. I think painting's maybe causing it. I don't know. And I've come to a realisation. I'm, I'm not very good at painting. Um, I'm quite clumsy. I'm not very dexterous. But I have very good ideas. And I'm able to somehow bumble along and execute them. No. There you go.